Hi, my name is Yasmin Tarehi, and this is Startup Confessionals, where we interview startup founders and entrepreneurs in the Middle East and Africa. We'll learn about some of the biggest lessons these founders discovered on their journey from the personal to the professional and share how they keep themselves motivated. Today's episode is with Talal Daba, the co-founder and COO of Jibril, a Swiss blockchain development company building decentralized financial products on Ethereum. He's also the co-founder of CoinMina, a regulated cryptocurrency exchange in Bahrain, and serves on the board of Middle East Payment Services in Jordan. I'm super excited to have Talal on the show today. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the chance, uh, Yasmin. It's a pleasure. So Talal, can you briefly share the value proposition of uh, CoinMina uh, and also Jibril, if you want to talk about that as well, with our audience? Sure, sure. I mean, um, both companies work in the crypto space, but um, in, in quite different, uh, different value propositions, different types of, of markets. Um, I'll start off with uh, with Jibril. Basically, Jibril is a, a blockchain development company that builds uh, decentralized financial products on Ethereum. And, and what that usually means is that a lot of the products are experimental because the decentralized finance space is still uh, it's picking up a lot, but it hasn't reached mass adoption. Um, so most of our users are, are uh, early adopters, uh, developers, people that are curious to know more about crypto, more than just buying and selling Bitcoin or more than just trading, the actual uses of crypto, which is which is why it's so exciting. Um, plus, the company has a, has a um, unique business model where um, basically the company conducted an ICO, an initial coin offering. Uh, so the company has a, a token that's listed called Slice. And all the services or all the revenues generated go towards uh, slice holders. So it's 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 a different uh, business model than than traditional venture startups, I guess, or traditional companies or venture backed startups. That's for Gibral. Um, CoinMina, we basically set up uh, because there was a clear market gap for a regulated crypto exchange in the Middle East. We do believe that the market has been underserved for the past, I don't know, five, six years. I even faced that problem myself in being able to reliably deposit and withdraw cash to your bank account where the source of funds is crypto. So CoinMina is a very simple offering where you can basically reliably and compliantly move between fiat and crypto and back. Great. And I think for the purposes of this conversation, we'll talk specifically about CoinMina. So Salah, can you tell us why you started CoinMina. You briefly mentioned it, um, but I think it would be interesting to understand the journey and also how many people are on the platform today and what the experience has been like for people who are, let's say, um, mainstream uh, investors who are investing in uh, crypto. We're basically three founders on the CoinMina side. Each comes from a from a different background, but we all share the same goal. Uh, which is basically democratizing access to finance through crypto. Obviously, the, the current product market fit is investors that are curious to allocate a portion of their uh, investable income or assets to crypto. Uh, they simply move from dirham, rial, uh, Omani, Kuwaiti, any GCC currency really into crypto. Um, but I guess the, the the inspiration behind setting up the exchange is that internet allowed us to move information around the world uh, in a much faster and freer and more efficient way. And we believe that crypto will be the way that we'll be able to move value along the way. And a core component of the crypto industry is your ability to go from cash to crypto and back. Uh, if you look at any jurisdiction where crypto innovation has flourished, reliable on-ramps and off-ramps is absolutely critical. And the process in the Middle East does have a lot of friction. So uh, it's a common problem that all three founders agreed uh, needs solving, which is, uh, I guess, why we we, we set it up. And, and if you operate in crypto, you have two approaches, really. You have the uh, move fast, break things kind of approach, which, which Binance and other startups followed, where you basically aggressively go after the market. You don't really care about financial regulations. And uh, obviously, it comes with a trade-off. Um, and on the other side, you could go down the regulated route, which makes it more of a marathon than a sprint, at least on the regulatory side. We went the the, the uh, latter, which is we w- went for a full-on license from the central bank. Um, but now it's it's a sprint to basically acquire users because 
Um, across the world, you see that crypto investors consolidate between two, three, up to four uh, exchanges. There is usually no winners takes all, which is something that's 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 very healthy for the market because uh, additional competition means better services, better user experience, better prices for crypto investors, which eventually has a net positive impact on on the industry in general. Got it. So how do you guys like compete with other exchanges in the region? And uh, just so I understand, so um, the fiat currency that gets converted to crypto on your exchange is specifically catered to the GCC region uh, in the Middle East, or is it applicable to North Africa and the greater Middle East? Yeah, so that's that's a very good question. Uh, at the moment, we operate in the UAE, Saudi, Bahrain, Kuwait, and Oman, which means we can basically quote you a price in your local currency. So dirham, a UAE dirham, Saudi rial, Kuwaiti dinar, Bahraini dinar, etc. Uh, which 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 is quite an important thing because um, when you're wiring funds to international exchanges in the US or Europe, the FX hit or the FX spread is 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 quite painful. Uh, it's not as painful as buying with your debit card and credit card because we've seen exchanges charge all the way up to like seven, eight percent, which is insane. But yeah, I mean, to be honest, all crypto exchanges in the Middle East that have a reliable offering are uh, experiencing solid growth because uh, it's 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 pretty underserved. If you look at the uh, exchange, a crypto exchange per capita, Middle East is definitely the lowest. But at the moment, we operate in those five countries and, and North Africa and the wider MENA region uh, is definitely something that uh, is on our roadmap. It's in the name, right? MENA is Middle East and North Africa. And we haven't really done anything in North Africa yet. But yeah, it's 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 definitely on our roadmap. And it's it's one of the, Egypt is, is one of the biggest markets uh, in the whole region. So it's it's uh, definitely one that, that we're looking at uh, closely. Oh, wow. Interesting. <laughs> so, so I am very much bullish on uh, crypto. I have been for a very long time. I think it's interesting, you know, because of kind of the, the deregulated factor of it that people who are, you know, Main Street investors can invest, I guess, any amount. Um, and then others who are more sophisticated are obviously investing higher amounts. But, you know, have you kind of thought about how to protect the main street investors? Because of course, there's all these laws, at least in the US, I'm not as familiar in the Middle East, but there's a lot of laws about, you know, caps on on what main street investors can invest in, let's say, you know, securities. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm just curious, like, do you have any kind of philosophy around that? I mean, I guess that there's a lot of disclosures and and statements that, that, state that you know people should invest at their own risk correct yeah i mean the the disclosure is one uh, is basically lawyers bs if you really have an intention <laughs> of protecting your investors you're not going to depend on your disclosures because let's let's be real uh, i don't think uh, any one of us has actually went through the disclosures word by word and even if you go through them you realize that it's basically telling you to like we are not responsible uh, you're responsible which which is Obviously required from a legal standpoint, but I personally don't think it's uh, sufficient if you have a, a long-term good intention of, of uh, making sure that your customer is prioritized. Um, so I think that, that that falls into two different buckets. There's investor protection in terms of bells and whistles and having the right custody in place, uh, the right processes and procedures so that you protect them from fraud, you protect them from basically what happened in South Africa and Turkey, where uh, essentially people within the exchange that had access to the crypto private keys took the money and bounced. It's as if you have, a, a, a I don't know, you store gold on behalf of your uh, investors or depositors, and then you don't have a clear system of how to protect that gold. Historically, we used to put men with machine guns in front of gold warehouses. Uh, but in crypto, you need to work with a global or a proper custodian that has state-of-the-art security practices, that has a very stringent process on the difference between hot, call it, hot wallet and cold wallet, with cold wallet being the safer route of, a, of a, a crypto storage device that's never touched the internet. Anyway, so this is the first bucket, which is custody, that type of investor protection. Then you have the other thing, which is uh, investor protection from a financial standpoint, which we uh, legally aren't providing advice to our customers, but it, it's part of your offering. So for example, on CoinMina, we're only a spot exchange, which means you don't have uh, leverage. 
um, exchanges that do have leverage obviously can do so in a responsible or an irresponsible manner. Uh, some exchanges give up to 100x leverage, which basically makes it much closer to a casino than it is an investment platform. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that it shouldn't be phrased or positioned as um, an investment or trade because it, it's, it, it's not really that when you're doing 100x leverage. Um, so the offering itself, uh, I mentioned spot versus leverage, but there's also the other thing of listing tokens that have um, liquidity, right? If I'm selling you tokens that are illiquid, then you're going to have a very hard time exiting that position, whether you're at a profit or a loss. So um, we do think that investor protection is is, is something that is mandatory uh, in, from a custody standpoint. But from an um, offering standpoint, we do think that it's a free market. And um, just like there's, there's a, a target market for people that want to use leverage, there's also other uh, curious but lower risk investors. So from that side, I... I, I um, have a neutral view to each his own. If you want to provide an exchange with leverage, go for it. If you want to do it with, but the custody part is the one that I feel very strongly about because we've seen countless cases from the Quadriga scandal in Canada. Uh, you had, yeah, I mean, you can you can look them up. There's been insane amounts of billions, billions and billions, like our friend Trump likes to say, billions and billions. And so there's <laughs> billions and billions that got lost on crypto exchanges for literally uh, internal fraud or, or negligence. So yeah, that, that part, that's where it's important to be regulated. Like the Central Bank of Bahrain are, are very on top of their work um, when it comes to making sure that custody part is done right, um, because this is a very, very important investor protection uh, area like if an investor buys I don't know Litecoin and it drops thirty percent, that's fine. But if an investor buys ten million dollars worth of Litecoin and then next day they disappear because someone stole them, that's a disaster. So um, yeah, I think those are, are are two separate topics related to investor protection that have different um, levels of importance, in my opinion. Right. Yeah. There's there's definitely been a lot of cases um, in the past. I think that there's been a lot more, um, I guess, like <laughs> strict measures on security, I'd say, uh, across the board, at least from what I've, I've learned in the United States, which I imagine you guys have focused on as well, like, you know, really prioritizing security above all else. Talal, can you uh, talk to us about like who your demographic or your audience is? Like, you know, what's the type of person that invests in crypto? Is it highly skewed towards one gender? Is it someone who's, you know, in the technical space? Like, have you even done this kind of research? I'm just curious, because I, I think that, you know, when you're building out marketing messaging for a company, a lot of it has to do with who your customer base is. So I'd be just interested to learn if that's you know, different from, uh, from, you know, the US and other countries, or if that feels like pretty much in line with, with kind of the global narrative. Yeah, I mean, uh, crypto users come from all walks of life. Uh, there's obviously common themes, but basically we, we do have uh, a very wide range of, of, of customer personas, if you may. So one, one very common one is obviously people that trade other types of volatile assets, commodities, FX, and, and basically people that come from traditional trading or investing experience. Uh, that's, that's one of them. Um, but there's also a lot of people that come from the financial background. So I guess to, to narrow it down, the majority of, of investors are between the age of 20 and 45, I would say. That is the majority of, of, uh, of investors. And male dominant, not as bad as other tech or financial areas. But yeah, I would still say that it's slightly more male uh, dominant in terms of, of investor and, and, and activity. But that's that's been improving. But yeah, I guess you have you have your students are very interested. Obviously, their average ticket sizes are quite different from. There's a lot of uh, uh, surprisingly uh, uh, professional services uh, professionals, uh, lawyers, consultants. Um, yeah, basically anyone providing uh, professional services, you 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 do see a good amount of interest from that. And surprisingly, a lot of government employees as well in the GCC. So people working in at government agencies, um, you you see that they log in usually after work hours and and spend a good amount of time on on uh, browsing crypto material. So it's a very diverse uh, set, but. 
to be very transparent, I mean, the Middle East market has lagged tremendously when it comes to crypto adoption, like we have in many tech-related trends. But in the Middle East, when it rains, it pours. Uh, if you look at food delivery, for example, uh, food delivery wasn't very popular a couple of years ago. Now it's probably the only tech vertical where we're probably the most advanced in the world. It's not neuroscience, it's food delivery, but we'll take it. But yeah, the trend on the crypto side is that we're hoping that uh, we'll see significantly more adoption because no exchange in the Middle East today has, I think the exchange with the most users has 100 or 150,000 uh, users, which is quite small if you compare it to to, to Saudi alone, for example, uh, or Egypt. Um, so yeah, we, we do think that in the coming three years, we'll see significantly more crypto adoption in the Middle East. And the macroeconomic social backdrop promotes that significantly because you have a very young population, insane smartphone penetration, decent amount of investable income. So yeah, we for for that for those reasons, I guess we're optimistic. Fascinating, yeah, wow. So I have so many questions. I'm trying to think about where I want to take the direction of this conversation. But I, you know, for uh, the banks in the Middle East, how have they reacted to crypto? How have they reacted to exchanges? You know. You know, obviously you've gotten a license, but what's been like the general kind of theme that you have felt and perceived uh, while you have been in the crypto space? They are dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is the one word, uh, honest feedback I'd, I'd give you. Uh, they're freaking dinosaurs, really. It's it's insane. Anyway, some are better than the rest. You asked about their reaction. Reaction would imply there is urgency. Uh, there is no reaction. They, they, they still haven't fully grasped uh, what's there. There have been some banks that took strides forward, which I obviously salute because it's, it's great to see banks basically adopting crypto. One very common theme that we saw in the past couple of years, which fell flat on its face and failed big time, and, and I'm, I'm kind of happy that that happened because I, I'm not a big fan of private blockchains. But a lot, of, a lot of banks said, yeah, you know what? We don't like crypto, but we love blockchain, which in my opinion doesn't make any sense because open systems always beat closed systems. So they said, yeah, you know what? We only want to deal with people we know and people we trust. Um, this is very ironic because the internet uh, initially was shunned by many where they said, no, no, you know what? Internet involves communicating with people we don't know and we don't trust. We only want our intranet, which allows us to communicate with people we know and we trust because the other side is very risky. So all these projects with IBM Hyperledger and, and private blockchains, I think, are destined to fail, where, where banks basically try to capitalize on the upside of, of blockchain and minimize uh, the risk adoption of, of crypto. But yeah, I, I, I don't think that that will uh, see the day of light, uh, the light of day when, when it comes to adoption. Um, banks in Bahrain have been forward looking because or have been able to give us bank accounts, essentially, because we're regulated there. But to give you an example, I and I kid you not, this is in 2021. A bank asked us to send them a fax. I'm like, <laughs> but no, no, please tell me you're not serious. Um, and they were they were dead serious. Who who even has a, a fax machine anymore? I mean, I think that's the the difficulty. Yeah. Hello, to 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 have fax on your, I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not going to even try to justify it. But they they were actually serious. They were like, yeah, sure. Uh, you don't need to come in and sign the document. You can just fax it to us. I'm like, yeah, this is an absolute. Yeah, I told them, can you please connect me with your head of digital transformation or I don't know what position, but that person needs to be talked to. Uh, you should throw away all the fax machines you have in the bank because it's 2021. Anyway, the, 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 the relationship manager was like, yeah, no, don't, don't, just don't, don't complain to me because this is something that apparently that uh, person has been mentioning inside the bank. So, yeah. That Anyways, is it's, hilarious. Like, okay, another thing that a crypto exchange coming into the Middle East would, would face trouble with is that if you download your Chase Bank or, I don't know, Swiss Coat Bank in Switzerland or pretty much any bank in the world, you receive a, a bank statement that includes full information. 
we worked with a bank, obviously don't work with them anymore, where the bank statement doesn't always include the name of the counterparty. So you have $12,000 deposited into your account. You just don't have the name. You have a code. And there's a no way, that's the internal code for the bank. There's no way for you to verify whether that code stands for Yasmin, Talal, or some other company. Wow. And they're like, yeah, but basically you'd need to either come to the branch to ask for the physical statement, which includes full details, but our online portal at the moment doesn't include this information. Like, yeah, okay, thank you. Please, please <laughs> send me where I need to fax my account closing documents. <laughs> oh my goodness. That is a riot. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, like trash talk banks because I, yeah, I, I would not probably not the best idea, but it's amazing <laughs> to see that there are banks that are forward looking. Uh, really, there, there, there are banks in the Middle East that are trying to make changes. It's just that the way these organizations are set up makes it very hard for them to uh, innovate. There's actually a very solid blueprint uh, of a bank in the Middle East that set up a fund and an accelerator, and they're absolutely killing it. So I think you can't paint all banks in the same brush. Can you tell us the name of the bank? Or yeah, is of that course. Private? Lala Adi, Arab Bank. Um, Arab Bank. They set up AB Accelerator. They set up uh, AB Ventures. And yeah, they, they've invested in several startups across the Middle East. They have an amazing team that has good venture, good fintech background. So I think they're doing an excellent job. And, and hopefully we see more of the same with, with other banks. Because if, if, you, if, if you know... In Manhattan, you have a Barclays Bank co-working space, and all the startups there are basically uh, Barclays venture backed. We don't have that in the Middle East. Now with Arab Bank, we do, but we've seen insane amounts of new VC funds pop up like mushrooms, and, and I'm not fully sure how much value these funds will bring to the table. Obviously, it's good for the overall uh, ecosystem growth in the short term, but I'm not sure how these funds will, will generate their returns. I would have been more optimistic on seeing corporate VCs, mm. especially ones in fintech, because, okay, obviously in, in, in traditional or in normal venture theory, you know, yeah, strategic investments aren't always the best. Uh, and I'm sure there's truth to that, but especially in the Middle East, the regulatory burden of setting up a, a like, for example, to get a PSP license, which is a payment service provider uh, license in Jordan, you, know, you need to put up three to five million dollars uh, as a deposit, which is like good seven, eight million bucks, which means it's purely restricted to uh, federal banks. Because if you're an early stage startup, how the hell are you going to lock up seven, eight million bucks in the bank? Yeah, I guess that's why I'd like to see more activity and, and investments between regulated financial institutions and startups. But we've started to see that, right? Checkout.com uh, led the investment round for Tamara, which is a buy now, pay later fintech startup in Saudi. So um, yeah, Checkout.com isn't a regional bank. It's a more established fintech player. Uh, but hopefully we'll see uh, more of that in the coming years. Super interesting. Wow. Um, thank you for explaining that and walking through that. Uh, so so I want to switch gears a little bit because this show is called Startup Confessionals. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I, I want to talk about uh, the biggest moment of adversity that you have faced on this journey and how you overcame it. And also if you can talk a little bit about um, how, how the company evolved. Did you bootstrap? Uh, did you get initial investment from people? What was that journey like? And then also... Um, kind of subsequently, uh, you know, what was what was sort of the adversity that you faced in this process? I think the biggest challenge came about when the Central Bank of Bahrain gave us our in principle uh, approval for our license after I think thirteen months of back and forth, and basically uh, there was a, a slight change in the structure where we had to kind of reset uh, um, a good amount of our of the work and progress that we've done which basically meant all our timelines were significantly shifted. Uh, the licensing process from A to Z took us, I think, uh, 16 months, even though on paper it should take 60 days. In hindsight, uh, it was very logical that the process took time because it's a new type of license and the regulator is in the right to take their time and, and, and make sure that everything uh, is done correctly. 
Um, but obviously, as an excited startup founder or founding team, you want to launch ASAP. For getting and keeping the team motivated uh, when you suffer delays of months on end uh, is quite challenging, but it's also a good test of character. So, yeah, it definitely wasn't easy waiting to to launch, basically. For, yeah, that 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 was uh, something that's that's challenging, but it also acts as a regulatory moat uh, for the the defensibility of your business. I mean, we've we've been live for I don't know couple of months and we have received a couple of acquisition offers offers which is which is quite crazy if you think about it because we've we've barely launched or or are very new to the market but the reality is they want the heavy lifting that was done on the licensing banking infrastructure side which requires a good amount of time and effort got it and you know what about you know from a, a financial perspective have you primarily bootstrapped this with your team yeah, I mean, it was uh, an interesting um, way. We met, said that we wanted to start CoinMina. And after that, we evaluated the requirements from the Central Bank of Bahrain. And we realized that the type of license that we require needs us to have about $670,000, uh, which is 250K Bahraini, uh, locked in a bank account by the time we have our in-principle license and our full license. So it's like a proof of capital. For up until the, the moment we reached uh, our in-principle approval, we had basically built the MVP. Uh, it was an internal effort. We, we barely had, we didn't have any cost. We were all working with, with no salary, which is, which is why it was easy to bootstrap it and not to have to raise. And then after we got the uh, in-principle license, then we had to basically put up the, the money in the bank and, and we used a crypto loan facility actually to, to basically uh, collateralize Bitcoin, take a loan, deposit the money in the bank um, and then pay back the loan after that was done. And, and now we've, we're completing uh, or completed our seed round, um, which, which we'll, yeah, thank you, thank you, which we'll hopefully announce soon. Um, but yeah, it will give us the necessary firepower to aggressively go after the market. I think by the time this uh, airs, you probably will have launched. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we can... did we did launch the it's it's the seed investment round that we haven't announced, but yeah, we'll probably announce it at the right time. We we uh, you know many of the investors already funded their investment. Um, Wonderful. Yeah, let's see. Let's see. It's, that's, uh, that's exciting. <laughs> it's not about in crypto. You can you can you can raise capital very differently from you what you would do in a traditional startup because the investor appetite is just insane you need to make sure that you have the right investors on board which is why we took our time in fundraising got it got it so um Talal, can you talk to us about like what motivates you how do you continue to stay motivated and you're obviously well versed in so many different areas so i assume you read a lot <laughs> uh of news in, in in very different markets so can you talk to us about that? Like, how do you stay so motivated? And like, why are you doing all this? Yeah, I mean, I would I would uh, probably classify or qualify the very well versed. Uh, I actually don't, I'm not very well versed in many topics. I'm probably well versed in crypto. And that's something I talk about very often. But outside of that, uh, yeah, there, there's maybe a bit of football here and there. But yeah, nothing else. I, I I would qualify that comment. Um, yeah, but in terms of what keeps me motivated, um, I mean, I personally see crypto as a generational opportunity. Um, people that adopted the internet early on were able to affect the lives of many others in a very positive way by basically using this technology to, to change how things work, not to improve existing processes. So I have no interest in improving existing processes. My What motivates me is creating new processes that allow people to uh, utilize this new tech or process uh, to improve their lives. Um, Jordan, where I'm from, 65% of the of the country doesn't have a bank account. If you don't have a bank account, you don't have access to credit. If you don't have access to credit, then you are uh, or if you don't have access to rely to reliable fair credit there you, then you're going to be screwed over by payday loans not being able to 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 have any type of financial planning or financial freedom so i i do believe that crypto is what will solve this um it won't be the incumbent institutions uh so so um 
Yeah, I mean, over the past five, six years, I would say crypto has been by far my biggest uh, motivating factor in 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 the uh, in the professional space. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, we'll have to test you on other other types of knowledge because <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I I disagree based on the conversation. I feel like you are definitely well versed uh, in a lot of different areas. Uh, Talal, can you? Talk to us about a, a book that you might be reading right now or a book that might have inspired you. I think this is like a good place to, for the audience to kind of, uh, you know, understand what books these, you know, founders are reading on the show. So if there's any book that has inspired you, it doesn't have to be crypto related, but it could be any, about anything really. Yeah, I mean, I'm probably, uh, in terms of uh, books, you can you can probably ask my wife about the random stuff that 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 uh, <laughs> that arrives at the house, and she's like, "Are you actually going to read that?" <laughs> um, but anyway, some of them I do, some of them I don't. But the most recent one that that really really uh, was great is called "The Psychology of Money," um, mm. and it's basically I, I would definitely recommend this book for anyone because it each chapter is a small story about a lesson uh, in in finance or money. Uh, so one of the one of the chapters that that was really amazing is basically says you know Warren Buffett who's worth I don't know eighty five billion dollars eighty two out of this eighty five came to him after the age of sixty five wow so only three billion was there before before that and that chapter basically explains to you the power of compounding because he started investing uh, in his teens he capitalized on the power of compounding which Einstein calls the eighth wonder of the world so. Uh, it's it's a very short no BS book. Each chapter is about a type of story or or um, a message related to money or finance, and it's very well written and it's easy 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 read. So I would definitely recommend that. When we first started Gibraltar, Liazan was telling me, you know, yeah, you know, you're going to be doing a lot of sales. I'm like, yeah, but I have never done sales before. Um, and I did a bit of research and found a book called, uh, it's by Ogman Digo. It's called The Greatest Salesman in the World, I think. Uh, one minute. Uh, great, yeah, The Greatest Salesman in the World. And it's really a beautiful book. It's uh, also a, a short, easy read, but it's it's amazing. So I would definitely recommend these two. Um, but I also like to read uh, on areas that you think you need to be better at. You know, for example, uh, this, this, you know, reading what's relevant to your current goals, I feel like has very solid upside. For example, the reading that uh, greatest salesman in the world before I had to do three months of pure sales was great preparation to those three months because it was fresh in my mind. Over the past months, I've been thinking a lot about money as a concept, especially with Bitcoin being challenged as as money um, by many. Uh, professionals around the world. So I thought I'd want to read something that's, I guess, related to that. I also um, really like stuff related to the Austrian uh, School of Economics, which I know um, hasn't been popular the past 20, 30 years, but I, I do think that it will see increased interest in, in, in Austrian economics. Okay, great. Uh, I have not heard of The Greatest Salesman in the World. Um, I have heard of The Psychology of Money, but I've not read either of those books. So I will also add it to my Amazon queue because I am a big reader uh, myself. <laughs> so nice. awesome. Thank you so much, Sal. And I have so many more questions, but um, unfortunately, we, we're out of time. Uh, so I'm sure you're, you're probably going to get a lot of questions after this airs. And so where can people find you if they want to learn more about CoinMina, if they want to invest uh, in crypto in the region, or maybe if they want to do another interview with you, well, where can they find you? Uh, Twitter or LinkedIn, both work. I yeah, deleted the Facebook and Instagram app. Uh, last <laughs> August, and life has been a bit more productive, uh, to say the least. So yeah, I'm using Twitter and LinkedIn. That's not to say I don't waste a lot of time on those, but at least it's it's two out of four now. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I've heard the same sentiment from a lot of people who've deleted um, social media platforms. So congratulations. That's great. So, okay, so Twitter and LinkedIn, and then uh, the website for CoinMina is? Yeah, it's just coinme coinmina.com. Perfect. Okay. And we'll leave that in the show notes. 
Salah, thank you so much for your time. Uh, there's, I just very felt very inspired by this conversation, and I also am excited to see where this goes. And I have just such high hopes <laughs> for Amazing. you in the region. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much. That's, that's very kind of you. Oh, thank you. And for our audience, thanks for joining and for listening to Startup Confessionals.